so many of us have spent countless hours watching these programs on television and to see and to meet Sir David in the flesh. I can't say it's as exciting as seeing the bird of paradise for the first time, but it must be pretty close and it's really, <laughs> it's really wonderful to have you with us and to uh, observe and to witness uh, such a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Uh, Sir David has agreed to take some questions and answers. Right, as I understand it, one of the major things that Wallace and Darwin disagreed on was spiritualism, and towards the end of his life, Wallace especially embraced it, whereas, of course, he, he outlived Darwin by, by several years. Um, to what extent did that sort of act as an abandonment of the notion of, of natural selection, if, if he believed in spiritualism? Uh, Wallace was um, unrestrained in his imagination, uh, and it's one of the uh, qualities of the man uh, that he was perfectly prepared to take something that others might think were absurd uh, and to examine it scientifically and properly. Uh, I have to say at the same time that spiritualism uh, in, his, in Wallace's time in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s uh, was a, a source of great uh, interest to all kinds of people. And uh, Wallace was as I read his, document, his books and his uh, account of his own life, still unconvinced one way or another as there was anything in spiritual, whether there was not. Am I mis mistaken, but didn't you actually do a program on the birds of paradise in black and white in the 1960s? Um, I first, uh, as, as I explained, uh, there are 40 different species of birds of paradise. And when I first encountered them, uh, I couldn't understand why they were so different. If they were so different, why they were all birds of paradise, why they were in the same family. And that little thrush-like kingbird of paradise is only that big, whereas there are some birds of paradise uh, which have a long tail, a ribbon tail, which, is, which are that big. Uh, and the clue lies um, in their... Um, the, the fact that the females are almost indistinguishable from one another apart from their size. And it is the selection of the females that have led to this extraordinary variation in the males, not only in their size, but in their color. And as you rightly say, uh, I've been trying to film Birds of Paradise for a long time. And I first went out to try and look for them back in the 50s. And in the 50s, television was only in black and white. And I did succeed in bringing back not the greater bird, or indeed the lesser bird, or the king bird, but another species called Count Raji's bird of paradise, which is very like the yellow plumed one you saw, except that the plumes are red. Uh, we filmed it in the early dawn, um, and in black and white, it really was not very good. In fact, it was terrible. <laughs> Uh, one of the problems we had in the 1950s was that we had no way of linking sound and picture. Um, and um, so you, I couldn't, I was doing the recording, a friend of mine, Charles Lagos, was doing the camera, and he had a 16 millimeter camera, which was clockwork, and when it, when it was running, it made a noise like a concrete mixer. <laughs> so you couldn't record a bird during, while, while that was running. It took us three months before we eventually found the place where Count Raj's bird uh, was displaying, and that bird displayed in the dawn, early dawn. And we built a hide, we got up in the middle of the night, and we saw the bird, and it arrived, and it was, we could see it, but the film in those days was so insensitive he couldn't film it. And we waited, and I was terrified that the bird was going to flow away, fly away, and we still hadn't filmed it. But eventually, there was just enough light for Charles to film it. Um, and of course, I was panting to record the sound as well. So uh, I kept saying, let me stop so I can record. And Charles said, no, this is wonderful stuff, wonderful stuff. <laughs> but eventually, he stopped. Uh, and I turned on this antique tape, tape recorder I had, and the bird went, wah, wah, wah. And it went, wah, wah. And then it flew away. <laughs> so, when we got this back to um, London, how was I to make a film with this very limited 
but it's sound. Well, uh, what we did in those days, I shouldn't explain really, but what we did was to simply take a piece of tape, tie them, join end to tail, and let it run round. <laughs> and that's what we did. And it was the first time Birds of Paradise display filmed in the wild. And in due course, I got a letter from my old professor of zoology. And he said, my dear Attenborough, many, many congratulations on filming Birds of Paradise in the wild for the first time. But I don't know whether you noticed, <laughs> but it's most interesting. The bird only called in groups of three and two. <laughs> And not only that, but alternately. <laughs> three, and then two, then three again, then two. I do think you should write a scientific paper about this. Thank you, that was a really brilliant talk. Um, you're obviously a very passionate taxonomist. I was just wondering if you had any concern that taxonomy seems to be a bit of a dying field. I thought parts of my private diary had been made public. So anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, yes, taxonomy. Yes, correct. <laughs> you are correct. Taxonomy is the absolute foundation of biological sciences. And it is unfashionable. There are many more glamorous things to do than to count the number of hairs on the head of a sweat bee. But the, the classification of sweat bee may well depend upon the number of hairs of the sweat bee. So it's a lot of hard, hard work. But if you don't know what it is you're looking at, your results are of very little value. So taxonomy is the foundation, and it's sad indeed that uh, taxonomy should be out of favour. Uh, the odd thing is, well, not about the odd thing, but when we were children, when I was a child, we collected things. Darwin collected beetles. Wallace collected beetles. Many of us will have collected bird's eggs. Illegal now in my country. I also collected stamps, I collected anything. But the point is that when you start collecting things, you see the differences, and you start to sort them out and you start to wonder whether this group is related to that group. And the sort of questions that occur to you are the actually basal foundation questions of any natural science, no matter whether it's entomology or ornithology or what. And uh, in my view, uh, um, taxonomy, uh, the state of taxonomy is very worrying. It's even, it is, however, even more interesting now than it has ever been. Because in recent years, the study and understanding of DNA has meant that we can trace, by giving DNA fingerprinting, you can trace the characteristics of one species and identify it from a little bit of tissue. But the exciting thing, the mysterious thing, and the thing which is worth a whole slew of new studies is that we're now discovering that there are some creatures that look identical, but which are quite different species as you can look at their DNA, and even the reverse. You can find some things that have identical DNA, but look quite different. It's a mystery, and what is the better in science than a mystery? Hi, Sir David. Um, I'm very passionate about the natural environment as well, and I love the birds of paradise. Um, and recently, I decided to have um, <laughs> this done on my back <laughs> in their honour. Um, I don't know if you can tell me which one it is from there. Uh, <laughs> this is my favourite bird of paradise, and I just wanted to ask you which one your favourite was. <laughs> she wants to know which your favourite bird of paradise is. That is hers, and I don't know if you can it see it from It would be very there. ungallant for me to say anything other than, naturally, yours. Yes. <laughs> so, David, it's been a great privilege for us to uh, be present, to be in your presence, to witness the lecture, 
and to see in the flesh this huge talent you have, not just of mastering the science and the natural sciences, but to communicate and popularize that science and spread that knowledge and excite and inspire your audiences all over the world as you have done for us this evening. We have a small gift uh, for you, a token of our appreciation, uh, a collection of some archival work that is indigenous to South Africa, to the Khoisan communities from 200 years ago, and we give it to you with our great pleasure.